Good morning. Another Teaching Tuesday. They come around quick, don't they? And we'll go ahead and open up to 1 John 5. Uh, continue our series by water and blood. Amen. Praise the Lord. I trust you are enjoying the series. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Jesus said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Um, and that's 1 John 5, 4. Uh, let's read that. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. But if you flip back to 1 John 2, um, excuse me, 1 John 4, and verse 4, 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now jump over to John 14, the Gospel of John 14, praise the Lord. I love this victory we have. It's a victory we have just because we are born again, seated with him in heavenly places. Um, it is John, maybe it is John 16. John 16, um, verse 32, and we want to get to 33. We'll start with 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yeah, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. So Jesus has overcome the world through his death and resurrection. And as you've been following me on these teachings, that when he died and rose again, he fulfilled the old covenant, thereby making it a last will and testament. And therefore, how do you inherit from a last will and testament? The person has to die. Well, Jesus died. What did you inherit when Jesus died? You inherited the life he now has because he's risen. So he died to give you his life. He rose to be that life in you. The um, 1 John 4, 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have already come the, overcome them. That is in the perfect tense. Who have you overcome? You've overcome those who are in the world, those who are calling themselves Christians but are not. That's why you try the spirits. We're not going to get into all that. But you have overcome them. You've overcome everything. Um, when in um, John, or excuse me, Genesis 22, um, Jesus talked about Abraham's seed will possess the gates of his enemy, which means you will be a conqueror. Nothing can stop you. Why? Because the same overcoming spirit that's in Jesus fulfilling the first covenant when he rose from the dead, dotted every I, crossed every T. He test drove this born again life. He, if you've seen my earlier video, the parable of Tom Brady is, you know, Tom Brady wins seven Super Bowls and then dies and, and, and is resurrected. Now you have Tom Brady's life in you, which means now you are in that, uh, position of having already won seven Super Bowls. So now as you walk out your life, you can win every event in your life. You can't go to God and say, oh God, this is too hard for me. You know, again, if, if God were Tom Brady, I know that sounds foolish, but it's a parable, that Tom Brady would be like, well, what do you mean he can't win Super Bowls? I won seven Super Bowls and then died and rose again. So the life in me is your inheritance. You have inherited my life. You've inherited the victory that I won seven Super Bowls with now you can win those seven Super Bowls. Now you can win the Super Bowl of your life. Everything I've called you to do, you can do because my resurrected life is in you. That's the victory that overcomes the world. That's the 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. God considers you already having overcome the world by virtue of being born again. And then 1 John 5, 4. 
For whatsoever is born of God, is that you? Are you born again? Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Positionally, you're already there. You're already seated with Jesus in heavenly places. Now walk out that position. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. As you are getting faith by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and then putting that faith into effect, you are executing the victory that you already have within you. It's all a finished work in you. You're seated with Jesus in heavenly places. You're an overcomer. And this may shock some of you, but do you realize there's nothing more that Jesus can do for you? He's already done everything he's going to do for you. Now you just walk it out. Yes, is he walking it out with you? Yes, he's walking it out with you by faith. Faith in what? Faith that you believe that he's already done it for you. Um, let's shoot over to uh, Romans 10. We want to get a good dose of the finished work and what I mean by um, that Jesus isn't going to do anything more for you. The problems Christians have in a powerless life is because in the name of religion, they're trying to get God to do something he's already done. And he can't do that. He, there, there's nothing more he can do for you if you're not believing what he's already done. If you're, if you're setting about through any kind of form of religion to get him to do something for you he's already done, he can't. There's nothing more he can do. Um, and that's very clear in Romans 10. Um, let's go with verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again um, from the dead. So what is he saying? Say not in your heart, who is going to go up to get to heaven to get Jesus to come down and die for you all over again. He's, he's already done it. We've seen in Hebrews where the high priest, he went in at the Day of Atonement once every year to offer up sins for the people. But it's obvious that um, whatever he was doing in offering the animal blood doesn't really take away sins because if it did, why did you keep going back year after year after year? No, but it says Jesus came once at the end of the ages. He came once to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, your conscience is purged. There is no more sin. You go on in victory. And yes, of course, if you do commit a sin, you can confess and repent. But the point is that one offering, one time, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, did away with sin. He doesn't need to come down and do it again. And what happens when we try to get God to heal us? We try to get God to meet our needs. We try to get God to come and comfort us, to come and answer our prayers is in our hearts, we're trying to get him to come back from heaven, come down, die on the cross all over again, become our poverty all over again, become our sin and sickness all over again, and then rise from the dead again to deliver us. But he says, say not that in your heart, because you can't go get him to come and do this again. And you're not even believing he's already done it. He, he's not going to come back and do it again. Um, hallelujah. And what that is like, a good um, parable, is for example, and, we, and you kind of joke about this, like, for example, say you need a ride to the store um, because you don't have a car. So you say, well, I'm going to call my friend uh, to come and pick me up. But then you go to pick up your phone and your phone doesn't work. So you say, okay, well, I'll walk over to my friend's house and tell him to come and pick me up to go to the store and then I walk back home and and wait for him to come pick me up and of course you're saying well that's ridiculous right who would go all the way to a friend's house to tell him to come pick you up and then walk home and wait for him to pick you up why didn't you just stay at the friend's house well that's kind of the same thing if you in your heart are trying to get God 
to come back and trying to get Jesus to come back and die for you again, what you are saying is, is I can go up to heaven to get Jesus to come down and to uh, do this all over again for me. But look, if you could go up to heaven to get Jesus to come down and do it for you, why do you need him to come down and do it for you? Because obviously you can go up to heaven to get him. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, if you have the wherewithal in your own righteousness to go up to heaven to get Jesus to come back down to die for you again, because this is what you must think within yourself if whatever form of religion you're living in is trying to get God to come, is you're establishing your own righteousness. You're saying, I can go to heaven to get Jesus to come back down and die for me, but why would you need him to die for you if you in and of yourself can get to heaven? Jesus had no reason to come and die. No, and, um, and Pastor Bronk, my pastor preached this one time and he did a fantastic job. And what he said is what happens is in your heart when you're doing that, when you're trying to get God to go up, to come back down for you, to save you all over again, that what you're doing is the position Jesus has as Lord. You're pulling him down from that position um, where it says, say not in their heart, uh, verse 6, who shall ascend into heaven? Then in parentheses it says, that is, bring Christ down from above. So when you try to get God to do something for you that he's already done, you are saying in your heart, okay, well, I can go to heaven to get him to come back down from heaven to die so I can then get to heaven. Well, if you already can get to heaven to get him to come down for you, then why do you even need him to be your savior? Because obviously you can get there on your own. So what you're doing in your heart, because you know that's ridiculous, you know you need him. So in your heart, when you set about to get him to come down and do it again for you, um, what you're doing is that position Jesus has as Lord in your heart, you're actually pulling him down from that position. In other words, he's never going to do anything on your behalf not because he doesn't want to. Of course he wants to. Um, he was the lamb roasted in hell for you. Um, remember the children leaving Egypt where they had to roast the lamb? You don't break a bone of it, but you roast it. And then you eat it quickly. And, and then they left Egypt um, after the Passover. Well, why do you think they roasted the lamb? Because Jesus himself roasted in hell, the fires of hell for your judgment. So of course... He wants to do these things for you. But what you're doing, if you're trying to get him to come down and do it again, is you're actually pulling him down from that place in your heart that's already done it, and you're never, ever going to receive that way. Um, you know, back to 1 John 5, we can turn back there, is this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, is at some point you got to stop and put your foot down and say, and say, I believe that Jesus has already done this for me. The, the victory I have in my spirit, I am an overcomer in my spirit because I'm born of his resurrection life. You're, the life in you is the same life that Jesus resurrected from the dead with. My friend, you are victory. There is no more victory to be had. Jesus Christ walked out of a grave. He walked out of hell. He walked, he paid the price of judgment, was born again through his own blood because he didn't sin. It wasn't his sin he was dying for. He was dying for our sin. And then he was born again by his own righteous blood. Isn't that amazing? How do you think uh, Jesus went from death to life? He became death in his spirit. He became sin. He himself then needed a redeemer, so to speak, not for his own sin. You know, don't, don't chart calling me a heretic, but he died for our sin, but he was still dead. So Jesus himself had to be resurrected back to life, and he was resurrected back to life through uh, his own righteousness, the righteousness he had when he was born of Mary that he set aside because he became sin, and then he was born again by that same righteousness, same righteousness you and I are born again by, his righteousness. It is by faith. Hallelujah. So, you have already overcome by virtue of the life you have in your spirit and the victory, the day the, where the rubber meets the road victory is even our faith. And I encourage you 
to uh, read below in the, um, in the description where it talks about um, praying in tongues and worship and fasting in the word. You know, these are the tools that enforce the position that you've been made. Um, your spirit is life because of righteousness. Um, so enforce that through praying in tongues and worshiping and getting in the word. Your body is dead because of sin. Your body cannot rule and reign over you. Not only where sin is concerned, but where unbelief is concerned. Whatever's in you that is not apprehending these fulfilled promises, because this natural body still from Adam that can't receive from God, you know, at the trump it's going to be done away with, or if you die before Jesus comes back, your body's just going to disintegrate into the ground, and you're going to get a new body um, that that won't that will work um, perfectly with the born again spirit when you're in heaven, but you can't, you know, in other words, you can't walk around on earth with it. So if you want to have victory here on earth, you have to have that victory out of your born again spirit while you're still wearing an Adamic body that can't believe these things, but praise God for fasting. You can enforce the position, the body's been declared, which is dead because of sin. It cannot rule and reign over you. It cannot keep you in a state of unbelief. Enforce that by fasting. Uh, so read those um, down below and, and start applying them uh, to your life. Ask the Holy Spirit, you know, how should I apply these things to my life? Because listen, there's victory. I can, speaking for myself, I don't want to get to heaven having regretted that I just lived the basic Christian life, uh, you know, because granted, praise God, you got to get to heaven. You know, you got to keep a good conscience and all that, maintain your righteousness, praise the Lord. But I want to go to heaven with much more than that. I want to go having served him with all of my life so I hear that, um, well done, thou good and faithful uh, servant. Praise God. So back to 1 John 5. I guess most of you are probably there. We'll do a quick quick review and see how much time we have to move the football forward. Praise the Lord. Oh, whatever we get done, we get done. We can come back next week or the next time. Um, so verse 5, 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcomes the world? but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Again, not big S as in Holy Spirit, small s as in born again Spirit. How did you get born again? Because you bore witness that Jesus came by water and blood, that Jesus was God, he became a man, born through the womb of Mary, with life in his spirit. He was the only candle lit. Everybody else was spiritually dead. Jesus was the only one with spiritual life. Um, at this point, God became a son. At this point, the first member of the Godhead became a father. He was the father to the son, the only begotten son, born of Mary, born into a body capable of sin, but he never sinned, lived out a sinless life, and then died in our shoes, in our place, that judgment for sin became sin, went to hell to pay that price, and then was resurrected, which is born by blood. He was resurrected by his own righteous blood. He went from death to life. You know, Jesus had to be born again. Again, not for his own sin, but because he became our sin. He still had to get life back, and he got that life back by blood. He was born by blood, by his own righteous blood, born from the dead, back into that same body, now glorified, and he sits at the right hand of the Father as a glorified man. When your spirit uh, hears the gospel, that's what your born-again spirit is agreeing with. Your born-again spirit has a capacity to know and understand God, and when you hear the pure gospel and you want it, you receive it and say, man, buddy, that is truth. I bear witness to that, and you become born again. Now, it would be good to let's shoot over to John 3. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love your word. John 3. You know, I love this part of what I'm going to talk about now because we all realize that people get born again when you accept Jesus. They say, oh, we went from darkness to light. 
and that's true and that is so true we did go from darkness to light but think about that for a second how can i go from darkness to light when i need the light to step out of the darkness with right i mean look at at john 3 he says something very interesting to um nicodemus you know nicodemus says in verse 2 john 3 2 the same came to jesus by night and said unto him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what's interesting about that verse is, well, if I have to be born again to see the kingdom of God, how do I see the kingdom of God in order to get born again? Let's read it again. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, if I have to be born again to see the kingdom of God, how do I get born again in the first place? Because don't I need to see it to get born again? But you say I have to be born again in order to see it. But how do I get born again in the first place? You know, again, if jesus when we accept jesus we go from darkness to light which is true but how do i step out of the darkness into the light when i need the light to step out of the darkness with praise god um hallelujah jesus i uh lost my train of track praise god holy spirit please bring that back to me and i trust you will for i know your voice so back to 1 john 5 um 1 John 5, verse 6, This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. So as your born-again Spirit bears witness that Jesus came by water and blood, you get born again. But you have to, if the born-again Spirit bears witness that Jesus came by water and blood, obviously you have to believe that in order to get born again, but it's only the born-again spirit that bears witness that Jesus came by water and blood. In other words, natural man cannot receive this. Um, we can go to 1 Corinthians uh, 2. Hallelujah. I, uh, I'm back to knowing what I was going with that. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 2. Um, we will go to verse 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So it says, look, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart the things uh, which God has prepared for them that love him, but he has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Well, doesn't he have to reveal them to me for me to even get the born again spirit? I understand that when I have the born again spirit, I can understand God, but I need to understand and see God in order to get the born again spirit to begin with. You know, so how does that happen? Well, that happens by Jesus in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, praise God. Um, I love this part here, 2 Corinthians 3, and we will, we're not going to go all through here, I've done that before, I don't have the time now, verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, actually, let's go up to verse 16, nevertheless, when it, talking about the, the heart, the human heart, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away, the veil of spiritual death. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that's another case where that big S is not the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the born-again spirit. Verse 17, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 
even by the Spirit of the Lord. And as you've heard me talk about before, notice the mirror image. It says, the Lord is that Spirit. And then it says, the Spirit of the Lord, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is. Notice he's reversing the order. He says, the Lord is that Spirit, and then he says, the Spirit of the Lord. Well, if you held up into a mirror, the Lord is that Spirit, you would see in the reflection, Spirit of the Lord. Yes, I understand the letters would be backwards, but the word order would be the original image is Lord is that Spirit, the reflected image is Spirit of the Lord. And we're looking into a mirror, so we're seeing a reflection of something. So when you look into the face of Jesus Christ, when you hear the gospel, that is the Lord is that Spirit. Jesus himself is in your presence, and he is that light that he is lighting your dark spirit with. Now, it's not you're not born again yet because you have to believe and accept it, uh, believe it in your heart and make him the Lord of your life to officially be born again. But when you're looking into the face of Jesus, it's a mirror. You're seeing his glory. You're seeing the glory of the only begotten son that the father sent for redemption. You're seeing, you're actually seeing, and we'll probably get to this later, how much the father loves Jesus. And when you look into this mirror, you're realizing, oh my gosh, he loves me that much. So the same resurrection that happened to Jesus, when you hear the gospel, you're looking into his face, you're seeing the Lord is that spirit, the, the spirit that you are born of. You are born from the loins of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And when you look into his faith, face, you're seeing that reflection. So he gets into your presence through the gospel. He lights your dark spirit. And now in that light, you now, and I think it's Psalm 36, in thy light, we shall see light. So when you get in God's presence through hearing the gospel, he lights your spirit. Jesus lights your spirit with himself. He's in your presence. He is light. He lights your spirit. And in that light, you look into his face and you see spirit of the Lord. You see who you are in Christ. You believe in your heart, oh, that Jesus died and rose for me. And you say, I make you the Lord of my life. And in that instant, you go from death to life. The split second you believe that Jesus is Lord, that split second in your, and just as you start to form the words of giving your life to Jesus, you go from death to life. And that brand new babe, bouncing baby spirit, your brand new child of God, in that millisecond, you're bearing witness, 1 John 5, that Jesus came by water and blood. You believe that God became a man, died under the weight of your sins, and rose again, praise God, and you become born again. Your born again spirit bears witness that Jesus came by water and blood. And where I was lost track of following the Holy Ghost earlier, is, you know, let's go back to John 3 just to uh, clear that up so there's no confusion. Again, that wasn't the Lord leading me wrong. It was me <laughs> abandoning his leading, praise God. So John 3, again, uh, verse 2 is Nicodemus saying, hey, look, we know you come from God because you do these miracles. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus is saying, no, no, Nicodemus, that's impossible uh, for you to know those. To, you don't know what you think you know. And he explains why in verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, if I can't see the kingdom of God until I am born again, how in the heck do I get born again? Because I need to see the kingdom in order to get born again. If I can't really know Jesus until I am born again, then how do I know Jesus in order to get born again? Because the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, the Lord is that spirit. When you hear the gospel or when you're in the presence of an anointing, like the, there's a story of somebody, Smith Wigglesworth was on a train and somebody just came on and just fell at his feet and said, my God, you convict me of sin because he walked in such an anointing. He walked in the light of Christ. And when that light was shining on people, their heart was in that light. The Lord is that spirit. And then in that light, they give their life to Christ because they see him as he is. 
in the split second they believe it and start to form the words that to give them to give Jesus their life they go from death to life and that brand new spirit then bears witness oh that Jesus came by water and blood it's an absolute miracle it happens in a millisecond he gives you the light of life on credit and with that light you see light you accept light and that light becomes yours you become born again and that's what one John 5 is saying that you bear witness that Jesus came by water and blood and a lot of you may say well Mike that's that's simple stuff of course uh, you know we believe that but the reason John is writing that in 1st John is so many people were starting to um, accept sin but still say that they were walking in a good place with God while they were actively sinning and the point he's making is you can't actively sin at the same time that you believe Jesus came by water and blood because if Jesus had a body and walked righteous in it and now you're born of Jesus if you're born again then you should walk righteous in your body so it's impossible to actively sin and believe that Jesus came by water and blood so many Christians today and, and maybe no longer they are Christians um, you know or, or maybe they're they're barely hanging on to their Christianity but so many of them are are um, believing in their mouth that Jesus is Lord they say all the right words but if you're actively sinning you do not believe he is Lord because if you did you would walk as he walked because you have life in your spirit and walk in a natural body the same way Jesus had life in his spirit and walked righteous in a natural body so if you're actively sinning um, you don't believe that if you're actively sinning no matter what you say you do not believe the gospel um, and if believing the gospel gets you saved well not believing the gospel gets you unsaved and if you don't think that can happen just read the book of Jude that's all I'll say just read Jude um, hallelujah check my time here um, so let's go on a little bit further with um, 1 John 5 praise God and I'll probably do more on that 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 in order to step into the light you have to already have the light to step out of the darkness with to get into the light um, and we're gonna and I've taught on that before but um, I can tell it's coming again praise God so moving forward verse 7 1 John 5 7 for there are three that bear record in heaven the Father the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one and there are three that bear witness in the earth the spirit the water and the blood in these three agree in one if we receive the witness of men the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God which he testifies of his son so we have two things here we have the witness of men what is the witness of men it is the gospel somebody preached to you that Jesus came by water and blood they probably didn't use those exact words but they ministered to you the gospel and you accepted it and you went from death to life that is the witness of man matter of fact that's the only thing a spiritual dead man can understand about God is is that which gets him born again you know Christ and him crucified that's the first step that's the first thing the only thing a spiritually dead man can believe is that um, Jesus has died and rose again for me and saved me and that's what we were just talking about the Lord is that spirit when you hear the gospel he lights your spiritual death with his light and with that light you see light with that light you accept and get born again in that light so that's the witness of men but he says here that the witness of God is greater so what is the witness of God well actually that's what we talked about these past several sessions with it is the testimony that God gives of his son that remember the promises that were made to Abraham were really made through Abraham to Jesus that's Galatians 3 16 now let's read that to put that fresh in our mind you can always pause the tape praise God um, or pause the teaching to get over there but Galatians 3 16 now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he says not into seeds as of many 
but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. And what he's talking about is, yes, the promises were made to Abraham in his physical seed. We talked about that before. But the point he's really making is he's really making these promises to that one singular seed, that seed that was born with life, which means he can keep his end of the covenant. You know, um, Romans 7, you know, the spiritually dead man tries not to lust, but the more he tries not to lust, the more he lusts because he's a sinner. See, Jesus didn't have that problem. So Jesus could keep uh, his end of the covenant. And of course, he died under the weight of you and I who cannot keep our end of the covenant, paid that price, became our sin, was born again uh, in righteousness. And we were, um, if you accept Jesus, you're planted with him in his death. And then you're also of that resurrection. I call it um, your Jesus's heart condition. If you heard of somebody who has a congenital heart condition, it means they were born that way. They were born with something wrong with their heart. Well, that's the very same thing that happened to you if you're born again, is the millisecond you accept Jesus as Lord, you become planted into his death and also of his resurrection. In other words, when Jesus rose from the dead, you were with him. You are now Jesus's heart condition. Jesus has a congenital heart condition when he was born from the dead and it's you and I. Praise God. So you are all mixed up into the DNA of Christ. That's why you're a new creature. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things are passed away. All things become new. And um, let's run over to that verse because there, there's a good nugget in there that you need to see and it will minister to your faith. Praise God. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, um, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And let's back up, actually, and go um, to verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In other words, if Jesus died for you, it's like he bought you. If he died for you and rose again, then you accept him, then you no longer live for yourself, then you live for him. In other words, you're born in his image, you're his property, you're bought with a price. You, you no longer, if you're not born in your own image anymore, you, you don't live for yourself, but you're born in his image, you live for him. And what's interesting in verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yeah, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And this is interesting. What is he talking about? Well, Jesus, according to the flesh, came as a Jewish man, uh, born under the law, obligated to keep the law. So therefore he was a Jew, People of other nations were Gentiles, but what he's saying is we don't know Jesus according to the flesh anymore. We no longer see Jesus according to his natural ethnicity. You know, if anybody tells you Jesus is a Jew, say, no, 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 he was a Jew. Jesus is no longer a Jew. Jesus um, is, he is one with us in a new species of man. Um, you can go to... Galatians 3. Let's go back there. Praise God. We're getting a lot of good stuff to show how you and I, if we've accepted Christ, we're new creatures. You are not who you were. Remember last week, Fred the worm and Fred the eagle. You're no longer that worm. You're the eagle. Even to the point of your national ethnicity, if you were born Mexican and you accepted Christ, you're no longer Mexican. You're a a species, a new species with Christ. You're a Christian. Yes, by all means, I understand you're still wearing a body that is Mexican and that is good. I'm not telling anybody to deny their culture. Those things are awesome. Um, but you are no longer a Mexican. You're a Christian. Jesus is no longer um, a Jewish person. He is a new species. Jesus used to be Jewish, but he's not Jewish anymore. That's what he means in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, nor do we know Jesus after the flesh anymore. 
And this may, well, some of you won't surprise, but if there's any Catholics watching, um, you'll be surprised at this, that um, Mary is not Jesus's mother. Now, I'm just going to let that sit a minute while you uh, imagine yourself throwing stones at me, but I'll say it again. Mary is not Jesus's mother. Mary used to be Jesus's mother. Mary, of course, we know the father of Jesus um, is God because the Holy Spirit hovered over the and, and the womb of Mary and and, uh, and conceived. In other words, he brought life to that egg that through ovulation of Mary, and then of course it went into the the uterus, and we know how all these things work and planted there and it grew and Jesus was born but Mary just gave him his body the Holy Spirit brought uh, birthed him with life in his spirit we know this so yes Mary was the mother of Jesus's natural body but as soon as Jesus died and rose again he does not have that Jewish Mary given identity into his body his body is glorified Yes, he was born again back into that same body, but then that same body was glorified. The same way life came back into Jesus' spirit when he rose from the dead into that body, that body became glorified. So now it is no longer Jewish. It is no longer from Mary. And in fact, not only is Mary no longer Jesus' mother, but Mary has become a child of Jesus. So we know, obviously, Mary accepted Jesus as Lord. She was one of the people in the upper room. So after Jesus' death and resurrection, Mary got born again. She became born from the loins of the last Adam, who, according to the natural flesh, happened to be her son. So she became a child of Jesus. But get this, Jesus, I mean, Mary is now in heaven as a born-again spirit. She does not have her glorified body yet. We don't have time to go all into that. Only those who died before Jesus is resurrection. They have received their glorified body. But Mary dying after Jesus is resurrection. She doesn't have it yet. So when Jesus comes back at the trump and we meet him in the air and we're all changed in the twinkling of an eye who's ever alive on the earth, we get a glorified body. Well, now Mary is going to get a glorified body. And now Mary, spirit, soul, and body is born from the loins of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So therefore, there is absolutely nothing left of Jesus that was born from Mary, but every inch of Mary will have been born from Jesus, the last Adam. Praise God. Um, so again, you know, Catholics, they, I'm not going to get into Catholic theology. That's a whole can of worms, I'm sure. I can't say I'm sure, but probably um, some of them are, are saved, that they believe uh, in Jesus to the point that there's a born-again experience. Um, I can't really speak super confidently about that, but I can tell you this, that the veneration and the lifting up of Mary is wrong. Mary would be appalled by it. And yes, of course, Mary is to be respected because of the faith. She'll be forever honored as everyone who walked out a life of faith. Um, and, and listen, not everyone does, obviously. Not everybody's going to be saved. And those who are saved, not everybody gets the same reward. You know, so there's different rewards. So listen, Mary is absolutely uh, to be honored in that respect as somebody who walked in faith, praise God. Um, but she is not the mother of Jesus. She used to be. Jesus is not Jewish. He used to be, but he now, along with those who are born again, are a new species, praise God. Uh, hallelujah. You know, we've overcome the world because in Christ we've already died and resurrected. The, the world and its system is under our feet, praise God. Um, so back to 1 John 5, hallelujah. So the witness, the witness of men, is the gospel but he says there's even a greater witness and that's the witness that god gives of his son so let's read that before we talk further verse 9 1 john 5 9 if we receive the witness of men the witness of god is greater 
For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. So in other words, when you believe it, when somebody tells you the gospel, when some man tells you the gospel, you're receiving the witness of man. You say, oh my gosh, I believe Jesus is Lord. You accept him. So you receive the witness of men. What he's saying is you're actually agreeing to a greater witness. And the greater witness you're agreeing to is the entire Old Testament and all four gospels. Everything before that happened before Jesus died and rose again. And yes, even, even after. But I want you to see so much that God, it's God himself who testifies of Jesus. So when you accept the gospel, you're not just accepting the story, excuse me, that a man is telling you about Jesus. You are, and that's wonderful. That's how we get born again, is men and women go around preaching the gospel. We're receiving the witness of men. But inside that witness is a greater witness. You're agreeing to the story that God gives of his son. And this, my friend, and, um, and, and I don't know how much I've talked about this before. I've preached it somewhere else, but I don't know if I've preached it on my videos. But that is why excusing sin is so bad, because if you excuse yourself to do sin, you are not believing the testimony that God gave of his son, which is the greater testimony inside the testimony you believe when you hear the gospel preached by man. So when you hear something about Jesus dying and rising for you, and you accept it and you get born again, inside that you're believing a greater witness, and that is the witness God the Father gives of God the Son. In other words, the whole reason God the Father sent God the Son was to die in your place to do away with sin so you could rise with him in righteousness and walk free of sin. That is the story God the Father tells of God the Son. But when you excuse yourself to do sin, you're saying, God, you're a liar. The story you give of your son is a lie. Well, listen, my friend, you're destroying your own born-again experience when you do that. In other words, you are, I, I like to call it, a person who has stepped off the Empire State Building. And what I mean by that is if you step off the Empire State Building, you may not be dead yet, but because you have stepped off the Empire State Building, you will be dead. It's a guarantee that at some point in your future, whether it's in one second, two seconds, and you can understand I'm using this as a parable, that when you begin to excuse sin, you're like somebody who stepped off the Empire State Building. In other words, you're heading towards the sidewalk of spiritual death. Am I saying this split second you excuse sin and, and don't repent of it that you lose your salvation? No, I don't know when that is. Um, maybe you, uh, you know, Galatians 5 says those who practice sin, they don't make heaven. You can read that yourself. Look into the Greek. If you actively sin, you don't inherit the kingdom. And it's in more places than that, but I'm not going to go to that now. So if you're excusing yourself to sin, you've stepped off the Empire State Building, and at some point you're going to die. You're going to go from spiritual life back to spiritual death. Um, you know, this is talking about habitual sins, those who live a lifestyle of sin, those who sin without honestly repenting and saying, Lord, I messed up. I did that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it again. Listen, if you do that, he'll wipe it away and forget it. Go on with God. You're, you're good to go. Sleep like a baby, but go and sin no more. Uh, but if you don't repent, which is the danger of the hyper grace message teaching that that's not necessary, then you're excusing yourself to sin. And at some point you're going to die because you are rejecting the testimony that God gives of his son, the entire Old Testament, um, all four gospels. Um, and of course the New Testament as well. It is the story that God the Father tells of God the Son. And when you believe it and accept it, you become born again. But if you excuse yourself to sin, you're saying, God, you're a liar. Your word says you sent Jesus to do me, uh, to set me free from sin. But obviously, um, since I don't have to repent and since your mercy and grace is so good, it's okay that I keep sinning. No, 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 no. What you're doing is you're calling God a liar and therefore you're removing him out of the picture and you're accepting a false God who's peddling those lies to you. Yet to you, it's a seamless transition. You don't know, you, you're not going to know when it's, when it's happened. 
you're just going to keep going thinking, oh, I, I worship Jesus, Jesus is Lord. But if you're excusing yourself to sin, at some point you're going to go from life to death. You're going to switch off the real God for a fake God because you, you're, you're walking more and more darkness. So you don't even know when these things overtake you as far as when you cross that line back to death. There's one thing you can do about it. Repent right now in the name of Jesus. And if you feel like you have lost your salvation, that's fine. Just say, Lord, my God, I'm convicted. Forgive me my sin. I stop. I won't do it again. And Father, if I am cross that line from life back to death, Father, I uh, give myself again right now afresh to Jesus as Lord, come and make me new again. And he will just that quick. Praise God. Uh, so if you want to stop the tape and repent it and honestly mean it and accept it, I encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, praise God. Now, we're not talking about, when I say actively sinning, we're not talking about being legalistic over every little thing because that struggle is going to come to you. Um, as you begin to understand that the born again spirit is a righteous spirit that you must walk righteous with, again, if Jesus walked righteous in his body, then if you claim to be born of him, then you would walk righteous in your body. It's absolutely ludicrous to think that Jesus, with life in his spirit, walked righteous in his spirit to provide salvation for me, that that somehow now excuses me to not walk righteous and say, oh, well, it's his mercy. No, 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 no. Mercy, you've stepped out of the limits of the definition of the word mis uh, mercy. If, if mercy was defined in a way where you can just sin all you want and God forgives you. That's no longer mercy. That's God being complicit with your sin. That absolutely is not mercy. Um, I love a parable I use a lot uh, as I teach, and, and of course we'll use it the more I teach, not that I have done a lot of teaching, but is how far can a man walk into the woods? I mean, think about that for a second. How far can you go into the woods? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. You can only go halfway into the woods because after that point, you're walking out of the woods. Um, and that's an important distinction to make because if you don't know the halfway point in the woods, you won't know when you've crossed that line of going into the woods and then when you start going out of the woods. And so many Christians get swept up not understanding the halfway point of truth so here with their mouth, they think they're still entering into truth, but they have no idea they've crossed that halfway point and that they're actually going out of truth. You know, yes, the mercy of God is a wonderful thing. Praise God. But if you don't know truth, you're going to think you're still walking into the mercy of God, but you're walking out of it. And think about it for a second. If you can sin all you want and God still has mercy on you in that sin, that's no longer mercy. You've crossed the halfway point of truth. You're walking out of mercy. What you're saying is, God, you are complicit in my sin. I mean, think about that for a second. If God is complicit in your sin, then why send Jesus to die for you if God is just going to be on board with your sin to begin with? He could have saved himself a whole lot of trouble and then just kept walking uh, with man as a sinner. But of course he can't do that. Um, I mean, that makes him a sinner just like us. That's ridiculous. Um, so, man, praise God that, you know, you, when you're born again, you have a good conscience. Uh, you can follow it. But I encourage you, again, do the things that the Holy Spirit, the tools of the Holy Spirit that I have listed below in the description. And the Holy Spirit will come and he'll help you walk righteous. Um, that's not an excuse to keep sinning until the Holy Spirit helps you. No, Jesus already helped you by setting you free from sin. But you do want to do all those things below in the description because the Holy Spirit will make a difference between what walking righteous means and that crazy legalism where you can have this messed up mindset that thinks you have to be this weird kind of perfection. Listen, that's not God either. Um, and again, back to hyper grace is they so understand that legalism is wrong, but they go from one error all the way to the other error, which is, oh, okay, well, then it's okay to sin because otherwise it would be legalistic. You see, they get stuck in that binary thought of there's only two things, legalism 
um, and, and a greasy grace. They get stuck between them, um, but they know legalism's not right, so they head towards the greasy, but of course they don't call it greasy. They just call it grace. And every time you might point out to them that they're excusing themselves to sin, they'll say, stay away from me, you're being legalistic. That's because they're stuck in that binary thought. But there is a place where you do not habitually sin, that you follow your conscience, and then the Holy Spirit will help you when the devil in your own mind says, well, okay, well, that means I got to be perfectly righteous about every tiny little thing, and oh no, I got to throw my TV away. Oh, I got to read the Bible 12 hours every day. Listen, the Holy Spirit will separate these things out for you so you walk righteous and that you don't walk in some weird form of perfection that God is not asking from you. And then he'll walk hand in hand with you and you'll go from glory to glory and he'll help clear up those smaller type uh, sins that confuse us. Um, you know, where we're not sure if something is sin or not sin. Uh, the Holy Spirit helps you with all that, but you can't use that as an excuse to do the bigger and bigger sins like drunkenness and fornication and pornography. I mean, the, um, you have a conscience to stop all that. If you're accepting that, you're not going to make heaven, so repent and then start doing the things below and the Holy Spirit will help you. Amen? Uh, hallelujah. Well, I got a couple more minutes. Um, this wasn't what I thought I would talk about today, but praise God, I'm not running the show. Um, but just to, uh, let's read the verse um, in verse 9, 1 John 5, 9, and we'll say a few things and then we'll end it. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. So again, when you hear the gospel from man, uh, what you are hearing is, yes, the witness from man, that's the gospel, that's what you've heard with your physical ear. But you're accepting something greater when you accept that, is you're accepting the testimony that God gives of his son, which again, which is why it's so terrible bad to begin to excuse yourself to sin because you're saying, God, you are a liar. And just to end, let's go to 1 John 1. We're not going to go all into this. I've, I've talked about it before on my First John Speaks Against Radical Grace. So listen to that series. So 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, present tense, if we say we have no sin, meaning you're somehow giving yourself an excuse to sin. You're saying, oh, it's okay that I'm doing this. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, verse 10 is what I want to get to. We, it's saying the same thing that 1 John 5 is talking about. Well, he's saying that in 1 John 1 because this is what the entire book is about. Is 1 John is a book about people who wanted to maintain a confession in Christ and actively sin. Those two things are oil and water. They never mix. So verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, what's interesting is this now is in the perfect tense. It's talking about the past. When it says in verse 8, we have no sin, that's present tense. So how does he go from verse 8, presently excusing yourself sin that you're presently doing, to verse 10 where it says, we have no sin even in our past. In other words, what these verses are saying is you can get to a place by presently excusing sin where you even go back to your past before you were born again and say, I have not sinned back then. And in other words, what he's saying is, if sin is not a problem for you now because you're excusing it away, whatever you're telling yourself in your mind, why it's okay. Oh, it's all by grace. Oh, we don't have to repent. Oh, Jesus paid for it all. So therefore, it's okay. I'm doing it. Whatever you're presently excusing, that's having a retroactive effect. And what it does is it actually destroys your born again experience because what you're really saying in your heart is if sin is not a problem now because it's okay that I do it, then sin wasn't a problem before I got born again, so why even get born again? And, and notice this in verse 10. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it means we call God a liar. Why? Because you're saying, 
God, the testimony you give of your son is that you sent him to die for the price of sin and then to rise again to make us new creatures. But if sin is not a problem for me now, sin wasn't a problem for me before I got born again, so I didn't even need to get born again. So therefore, God, you're a liar. All this you say about Jesus is a lie. You didn't even need to send him for my sin. All that is a lie because if sin is okay now, sin was okay before I got born again, so why should I even have got born again? And what John is saying there is you can destroy your own born again experience through sin. If you're presently sinning, then that is going to retroactively affect what happened to you in your past when you got born again, and you'll destroy that event. And if you think that can't happen, then go to Matthew uh, 7. Let's run over there before we end this. My God, child, if you're struggling with sin, God will walk through hell with you. He loves you. Um, he will absolutely forgive you. Just repent and uh, go in sin no more. Praise God, yes. In Romans 8, you have new life in you, so you can stop sinning. Yes, you can. Matthew 7. Hallelujah. Verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It, look, notice what he says, I never knew you. Even though you were born again at one time, casting out devils, uh, preaching the gospel, doing many wonderful things as a child of God, but you got a hold of a bad doctrine, begin to excuse yourself saying it's okay to sin, and you destroy your own born again experience, Jesus on that day is going to say, I never knew you, never at one time uh, did I know you. Um, and the reason he says that is verse, go to verse 17, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit so as um as that fits with uh 1 john 1 1 john 1 8 if we say we have no sin which is present tense excusing sin oh this isn't sin or or if it is sin oh it's okay that i do it if you present tense saying you have no sin, that is bad fruit um, on your tree. Well, it's impossible to have bad fruit unless you're a bad tree. So 1 John 1 10, where it says we have not sinned, perfect tense, meaning in, in the past, if sin presently is not a problem for me, then that means why get born again? So you go back to being a pre-born again state. You retroactively destroy your own tree because if sin's not a problem for you now, it wasn't a problem for you then, so why get born again? And if you're producing bad fruit now, it must mean at some point in your past, you became a bad tree. So you actually go from a good tree, born again in Christ, back to a bad tree. And what does a bad tree do? If you've planted a bad tree in the past, it zips forward to the present tense and there is your bad fruit, that present tense sin you're excusing. It came from a tree that you became in your past when that tree was planted. So you actually retroactively go back to an unborn again state because you're saying, God, you're a liar. You didn't even need to send Jesus to set me free from sin because sin isn't a problem. And listen, you're not going to, uh, you know, some people do. They go so, so far to say it with their mouth that, ah, oh, Jesus, that's, that's nothing. Sin's not a problem, and they walk away that way. But others walk away still maintaining Jesus on their lips, but in their heart, they're saying, God, you're a liar. You, sent Jesus, you said you sent Jesus to do away with sin, but obviously, I'm still sinning, and I'm walking with you, so you're a liar. And right there, you see a switch is made where you've left off the true God for a fake God, and you didn't even know it because you're walking in darkness. Uh, you know, so you can absolutely go back to a, being a bad tree. And that's why you have bad fruit. And listen, we're not talking about uh, 
driving 25 and a 20 mile an hour speed limit listen there's absolutely a difference in sins between what is blatant habitual sin and what is more smaller type sins that the Holy Spirit will help you with um, but listen you have a conscience follow that conscience that'll keep you straight um, but stop habitually sinning praise God stop the drunkenness fornication pornography R-rated movies that kind of stuff sends you to hell um, and then as you stop that keep praying in tongues add in some fasting and some worship and the Holy Spirit will help you walk that pure life and then he'll also help you distinguish um, the more smaller type things that aren't that big a deal that God will help you with and the reason he helps you with the smaller type things is because there gets to be a confusion between okay well what is my born-again righteousness versus this natural body I'm still wearing from Adam that confuses me so we have this on the smaller things we don't quite know exactly how to walk all that out perfectly as we should but listen the Holy Spirit will help you with that and that's the good side of a good tree produces good fruit is when you walk with Jesus not habitually sinning and if you do sin you repent is you are a good tree which means it's impossible for you to produce bad fruit so then when you get to those smaller type things that confuse you like oh, well is it okay even to watch certain PG movies you know legalism tries to get us to throw our TV out but listen even if there's a little confusion about these small things you're a good tree you're producing good fruit so he'll even purge and prune you of that confusion so you can walk even more perfectly righteous in the small things but you cannot use that as, as an excuse to go and sin on the bigger things uh, so praise God I trust this was helpful to you and we will see you next time bye bye